with Marcel Duchamp, surely, surely, surely. Uh, and then I later discovered that I was supposed to make a more, it wasn't a conversation, one was supposed to make a more protracted form of utterance. And that, of course, information was received a little too late because I would have liked to assemble a number of slides which turned out not to be possible. I gather that various themes that are being discussed are process rather than product. And of course, the dematerialization of the object, which seems to me to have been going on for so long that you'd imagine that the object might well have disappeared by now. Uh, <laughs> but it seems to be extraordinarily persistent. Uh, also involved in this business, there is undoubtedly something called the presence of absence. Uh, which naturally one can justify the presence of absence by all kinds of arguments probably relating to Zen Buddhism and the mystical traditions of Christianity for all I know. Uh, I was talking to Cedric Price upstairs a minute ago about this business of the presence of absence. Uh, if this conceptual thing is something, I have no objection to it, if the conceptual thing is something that you can specify and uh, send the specifications by telegram, uh, etc., also, if it's building so dematerialized that somehow it doesn't have to exist, you don't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't measure it. Again, obviously, we're talking about some kind of mystical essence. Uh, I was interested in this issue, talking to Cedric Price, about the possibility of conceptual cooking. <laughs> and one imagined the situation. Uh, in which you invite people to uh, a conceptual dinner party and everybody is equipped with a recipe book uh, which they proceed to contemplate, uh, the contemplation of the specifications for the meal being the equivalent to the meal itself. Again, I can see that having value. I would infinitely prefer, for instance, to sit up there with a good recipe book then go into the establishment next door and eat those deplorable English sausages and consume that abominable beer. I'd much prefer to sit up there with a the recipe book. But anyway, that is a frivolous aside. Uh, what I decided that one could do was to throw out a number of themes uh, for discussion, uh, since this is supposed to be a conversation. And the themes are awfully sort of old hat and churchy. Uh, I think they are in some way relevant, though their relevance may be a little bit dubious and uh, their connections to relevance may be a little bit attenuated, shall we say. Anyway, my first quote was, and it should please the semanticists and the semiotic people, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, that should captivate uh, Chomsky freaks, I think. Uh, and then my, that of course follows up, is followed up by the subsequent statement, Gospel of St. John, verse 14, chapter 1, the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So at the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Okay, uh, I take it it can be translated as in the beginning was the idea and the concept. And that the concept was made palatable, was equipped with length and breadth and height and texture and if you like smell and substance, whatever it is you're dealing with, uh, was made incarnate in some way or another. And I don't really see much to argue about there. I'm perfectly willing to concede that in the beginning may have been the word, why not? Uh, the business of the word was made flesh uh, raises question marks, I think. Uh, you might ask, and I'm presenting all these as themes for discussion, can the word be made flesh? Uh, or is that, was not that a Christian fantasy? Uh, should the word be made flesh? Uh, is this embodiment of the word in flesh to make it intelligible? Or is it simply to adulterate the word? Uh, I'm going to answer for myself all those questions in the affirmative. The word, I suppose, can be made flesh up to a point. Perhaps it should be, sometimes, though not always. Uh, this embodiment does help to make the word intelligible, 
but it is also adulterating the word, adulterates meaning. Uh, that's to deal with one text. My next text is equally churchy, and this time it is St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, which is, the law came in that the offense might abound. Uh, now, that again is one of those more captivating things in the Bible. Uh, it's obviously a much, much more difficult statement to handle. Uh, does, it mean, does it mean that the normative has a kind of use as a surface, a surface, a background for the display of the deviant? I think it means that, among other things. Uh, does it mean that the typical is useful as validating the exception? I think it also means that. I think it also means that the ground, if we're talking Gestalt stuff, the ground stimulates the intimate apprehension of figure. I think also if we were using Levi Strauss's language and we think about the law came in that the offense might abound, this is what Levi Strauss would call the precarious balance between structure and event, uh, which is also the balance between scaffold and happening and grid and episode. One remembers that little piece of Celia who says, by an error, I mean to do contrary to the precepts of Vitruvius. <laughs> and uh, it also involves, I think, the law came in that the offense might abound, uh, implicates somehow the two-way commerce which should and always does exist between those corollary things which one might distinguish in present-day jargon as the establishment and the revolutionary principle. Uh, of course, they interdependent activities. Okay, that's my second text then, the law came in that the offence might abound. I think it's a very important subject to discuss. It could be discussed for hours. You can imagine sort of Talmudic types and medieval scholastics, scholastics going on with it for days, if not for years. Okay, my next statement then, my next uh, piece is that famous sort of Saturday to Monday at Windsor in the 1860s when the uh, Dean of Windsor said to Disraeli he did not believe in dogma. And then, of course, there's Disraeli's famous reply. Well, really, Mr. Dean, I'm afraid no dogma, no dean, Mr. Dean. <laughs> Uh, now, that, I suppose, is a criticism of certain, on Disraeli's part, a criticism of certain aspects of liberalism. It's a criticism from a Jewish point of view of English empiricism, and very right too. It's a criticism of French positivism. It's a criticism also of English utilitarianism. It's a criticism of many of the pretensions of the social sciences. It's a criticism before the event of modern architecture and the doctrine of Walter Gropius and the characteristic mentality of the planner. I can see it as a criticism of all those things. It implies that there is no such thing as neutral observation, that all observation is culture biased, as we know, that we can never hope for an objective view of things, the best we can hope for is a kind of argument between different styles of subjectivity. People, I think, unless they are social scientists or planners, uh, or allied personalities uh, tend to accept such statements as that at the present day, although they don't always act upon them. One begins to think the statements of that kind are banal, but perhaps they're not. And then, having those three quotes, I wish to interject uh, something else. I wish to take up the issue of tradition. Uh, several people use the word tradition. I noticed yesterday, more people may have used it this morning, for all I know. And sometimes you hear of the, even the tradition of modern architecture. Uh, if you look in the shorter Oxford Dictionary, uh, one of the first meanings given to the word tradition, apart from a handing over and all that business, is a giving up, surrender, or a betrayal. And it follows that up with the statement that a tradition is also particularly a betrayal of sacred books in times of persecution. Uh, you can commit a tradition, in other words, uh, which uh, entertains me as a possibility. Uh, what I want to emphasize is I, I do not claim to know anything about etymology and that kind of thing, uh, but related to the word tradition are the notions of trade and treachery and bargaining and the betrayal of principle. 
and the making of treaties and low-class diplomatic skills like those displayed by that dreadful man Kissinger uh, and uh, translation. You get it obviously more clearly in French, I suppose, when a traité is a treaty and a traiteur is a traitor. And the implication surely is that somebody who makes a treaty is a traitor. Uh, he is betraying principle in the interest of survival. Uh, in this sense, one has to see, I think, Judas as the absolute beau ideal of the traditionalist. Uh, he performs a necessary act of betrayal in order that the Christian religion, for what it is worth, could be institutionalized. This is a profitable desertion to the establishment, profitable for the revolutionary principle. Uh, what Judas does, surely, is to save humanity from the deserts of the spirit, uh, which unmitigated Christianity would have condemned it to, and uh, make it safe, steer it yet again towards the warm, soft harbors of the flesh. Okay, uh, so those are different arguments, surely, that one would take. Uh, the business about, in the beginning was the word, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then this uh, funny business about the law came in that the offense might abound. And then uh, another one, this thing about tradition as treachery, as betrayal. But perhaps every day in that context, one has to betray principle. And perhaps every day, one also has to revive principle. It's something you have to kill and uh, reanimate, I would imagine, every day. Then it occurred to me this morning that I could even at this stage interject a, another quotation. Uh, this is a kind of collage or ready-made technique of making a talk in which you splice quotations together. Uh, and this is from Dr. Johnson and it is from his magazine called The Rambler for January the 25th, 1752. And it goes as follows. Wit, you know, is the unexpected copulation of ideas. The discovery of some occult relation between images in appearance remote from each other. And an effusion of wit therefore presupposes an accumulation of knowledge. A memory stored with notions which the imagination may cull out to compose new assemblages that might perhaps should be assemblage, I don't know, uh, whatever may be the native vigor of the mind, she can never form many combinations from new ideas, as many changes can never be rung on a few bells. Accident may indeed sometimes produce a lucky parallel or a striking contrast, but these gifts are not frequent, and he that has nothing of his own and yet condemns himself to needless expenses must live upon loans or theft. Uh, there are certain things which I think are relevant to the present condition, including the idea of wit, uh, the idea of collage, ready-made, and all that kind of business, which is, I think, implicated uh, in that statement. Then I thought that I would briefly reminisce, um, which is always a deplorable thing to do. Uh, I suddenly remembered while somebody was talking yesterday an occasion in Texas, long, long, long ago, almost before the beginning of time, uh, and uh, in the high Eisenhowerian period, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, this was, the university had what was called Religious Emphasis Week. Uh, and uh, Religious Emphasis Week, it really didn't matter what religion you emphasize. You know, after all, we are a pluralist and liberal society. Uh, we merely want people to emote and feel religious. We're not really interested at all in the substance of their beliefs or the structure of their beliefs. Anyway, this was Religious Emphasis Week. It related to that period, you know, when you got those dreadful slogans like, a world of prayer is a world of peace, which is preposterous, and that even more deplorable statement, the family that prays together stays together, <laughs> uh, which in the high Manson period, a couple or so years back, was turned into the family that slays together, stays together. Uh, okay, uh, so there we are in Mishmash land, and quite sooner or later, we're all going to enter Mishmash land, if present tense is continued. I say it's called pluralism. 
Uh, but I was walking down the street in Texas with Honey John Hager, of all people, and he suddenly said, Christ, isn't it really wonderful that there really is a Pope in Rome? Uh, and uh, I am not an enthusiast for the Pope, uh, but there are certain circumstances, certain predicaments that you find yourself in when he becomes a useful entity to presume. You can delete the Pope. It's quite the easiest thing in the world. Uh, that is what Protestantism was all about to begin with. And you can substitute, if you like, the Supreme Court of the United States, or you can delete the Pope, and if you like, propose that we all skip around with Super Studio, uh, preferably naked, in the Cartesian coordinates of freedom. Uh, uh, that is another thing that you can do. Uh, but what, what one is talking about, again, is surely a version of the law came in that the offence might abound. Uh, you're talking about the ordered guarantees which have to exist so that spontaneity can exist. You are talking about, again, the intimate two-way commerce between establishment attitudes and revolutionary principles. You can't get along without both. I was also reminded this morning, and I will not give the name of the person uh, that this story relates to, but this was back in Cambridge, England, and somebody rang up, a person who stammered rather a lot, and said, Colin, do you think that we might possibly have dinner? And I said, well, yes, why not? How about tonight? Uh, to which the reply was, uh, I'm afraid that I'm dining at Trinity this evening. So I said, well, how about tomorrow night? Well, I'm, I'm afraid I'd be in town and be dining at the, the reform club. So we went through this list of possible dates, and the first time we could have dinner was in three weeks' time. And then <coughs> the end of the conversation was, you see, what I really want to talk about is spontaneity. <laughs> and that's a little cruel, but I haven't mentioned the name. Uh, but I feel sometimes that one is in the presence of, you know, a protracted talking about spontaneity, which basis spontaneity will surely never come. You know, there's that piece of sherry, isn't there, which can rarely, rarely cometh thy spirit of delight, you know. Uh, obviously, you want it to come frequently, and you want things to be spontaneous, but, you know, that's much harder said than done. Uh, if I had been going to make a proper talk, I would have liked to have had, as a primary image, uh, that uh, picture from Albert Speer's book <laughs> of memoirs showing the first Nuremberg rally, uh, in which this arena is built up out of floodlights, which are centrally inclined, which Sir Neville Henderson spoke of as a cathedral of ice. Um, and Spare was particularly moved in this structure of floodlights by what one imagined was the rather Wagnerian movement of the clouds backwards and forwards between them. Uh, again, one might see that as structure and event. The clouds being event, I do not know. But I would suppose that this arena for the Nuremberg rally was a very, very perfect illustration of a dematerialized architecture. Uh, you turn the switch and it's there. You turn the switch and it goes away. Uh, it is also an architecture which obviously could be specified by telegram. Uh, and uh, I would rather like to have had it because I think it is rather an eloquent sort of image. Uh, I'm sure that again, but I wasn't here this morning, uh, Somehow, Marcel Duchamp does drag his way. One could imagine him walking in and dragging his way all around the room, disguised as that female that he disguised himself, what we should call Rose uh, One could imagine it. Uh, again, though, one would like to bring, say, somebody like Duchamp, uh, perhaps, into a parallel, say, with Fernand Leger. Uh, I infinitely more enjoy Duchamp. Uh, who seems to me to be lucid and illuminating and entertaining and all that, fragile, poetic, lyrical. Uh, whereas surely, by comparison, would one would find Leger uh, turgid, opaque, heavy, often a little wearisome. On the other hand, I suspect that Leger is maintaining the establishment 
or to some extent, against which a Duchamp type of personality uh, might possibly be able to perform. Again, I suppose one ought to, it was brought up yesterday, uh, produce the Maison Domino as the instance of a concept by certain definitions, and also to notice that it was never built. Uh, in other words, the Maison Domino is a kind of conceptual necessity, an heuristic device, but then in reality, uh, this thing has to be modified uh, for, you know, well, because of the exigencies of perception. It becomes modified in the most extraordinary variety of ways. Now, I presume that there must be a two-way commerce between uh, concepts and percepts, uh, which means between intellectual and physical stimulus. And uh, I am a little baffled, I say, but I am waiting to be instructed. I'm a little baffled by uh, except in one more Zen kind of moments, uh, how one is to react to something which quite simply is not there. Uh, the specifications are there, but nothing anymore. Again, it's the presence of absence. And in order for absence to be felt as a presence, in a lot of other places, there's got to be a lot of presence. Otherwise, uh, you know, no hole is visible unless there's a solid that you can make the whole in. Uh, that is the substance of what I have to say. Uh, it doesn't take anything like the length of time uh, that Peter allowed me to, or proposed that I should take. Uh, but I say the, the issues which I think are interesting are the word was made flesh and well to Marxists. Can it? Is it? All that stuff. Uh, the next one, the law came in that the offence might abide. Uh, no dogma, no deed, Mr. Dean. Uh, tradition as betrayal of principle and the need for principle and the need for principle to be constantly betrayed. That's, it may be a little remote from the subject, but I don't think it is in some areas. You have very well described, I think, a talk with my view. Yes, that, that's it, it's conceptual <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> particularly, no. It's a crude little scheme. It doesn't go into minute distinctions of that kind. It deals with big, cheap symmetries. I, I, I wonder, because I think you, the Oxford English Dictionary sort of scene would, would make a distinction between ideas and, and concepts, and the ideas would be platonic and unrealizable, totally, whereas a concept would be much more to do with Aristotle and categories and realizable, and I wonder whether... It seems highly likely. Graham, that kind of thing is quite beyond me, about me. You know, I'm an impressionist. What would a writer, Graham, that may have drawn sorry, I'm not a doctor, Zen was certainly around 
when Bob Maxwell, Colin, and I were all teenagers and little kids in the university, because we were, because I introduced it. And I got this out of the because I found I couldn't play poems without something to make them in. And I found that the critical thing at the time was what I made holes in. In other words, it was the autonomous law I attacked, not the atmosphere of total undogmatism that I always took as an ideal situation. So, if now people accuse me of being a tired sick, which they frequently do, this is only because I've realized that the material you've got to make holes in, whether substantial or intellectual, is in many cases considerably more important than the shape of the holes that you make. I think probably that somewhere has some bearing on conceptual architecture. Uh, I would like to know how much of five architects is holes and how much is substance and what either has to do with conceptualism in architecture. In fact, I think the whole conceptual architecture personally is a complete red herring. <laughs> <laughs> There is, I think, something, you know, there's a propensity in modern architecture that I call object fixation. Um, probably at no other time in the 20th century have people been so concerned with making significant objects. And at the same time as making them, uh, they have great guilt about these objects and wish them to go away. There's complete ambivalence in reaction to the object. Uh, it's notorious in a little quote from Corbul that Fred Cota found the other day, in which Corb says, uh, great blocks of dwellings run through the town. What does it matter? They're behind the trees. Uh, nature has entered the lease. Uh, and this is simultaneously you know, the affirmation of the object and then inhibitions about the object, which appears to be something that we all suffer from. I think that has a lot to do with conceptual object, somehow. There's a corollary to that, I think, and that is doing a very great deal of damage in practice. This is that because we're all being trained to be architects, the first of whom was presumably Alberti, and the second of whom was presumably Al, Al Michelangelo, and the third of whom was presumably Le Corbusier. Therefore, everything that we touch has got to be transformed by our fairy one from dross into gold by some kind of magical uh, alchemist transformation. <coughs> now, it just so happens that a city entirely made up of important works of architecture, like those imaginary reconstructions to find in 18th century engravings just up Gower Street at Winebreds, of what Rome should have looked like and mercifully never did, is totally uninhabitable because it totally destroys a normal apparatus of human perception, which is, to use Cornelian phraseology, if you go in a situation, you distinguish objects against a background, even artistic objects, you put a damn frame around them. <coughs> My problem in conceptual art is that if conceptual <coughs> art is set up the non-artistic, then it defeats its own object straight away, because even if you play, take a piece of driftwood, as they used to do in the late 30s, the English surrealists used to collect this drip, drip with a little bit like Henry Moore's and put them on mantelpiece. The mere act of putting them on the mantelpiece frames them just as surely as you can be framed by a mantle, <coughs> a mark mantle, a mark. I think my difficulty with Colin, and it's a pity to have to admit it, but I can speak to the light of Colin. But there is a difficulty which I have, I suppose it may be Richard Ferris who's working on uh, or it may be excessive idealism in some remote <coughs> way. But basically, it seems to me that his, his description of the field of action uh, seems to give rise to a situation where when the Prime Minister comes to you as President and says, Mr. President, sir, since we run the palace, the bombs are coming over, I'm afraid this is the end, and the President says, boys will be boys. In other words, the roles seem to be dictated 
whatever is happening, whether the vegetation has to invest in and destroy it or not, uh, there is a point of view, uh, uh, a genial after point of view, from which all these events can be looked at as relatively harmless. And uh, given the fact that over and over again we see these uh, roles replayed, what is it that gives them point and purpose at any one moment? Is it wit? Or is it empirical, empirical uh, the, the actual problem of the moment, survival? I sort of wonder, well, I mean, I will be discursive and digressive. I have always presumed a relationship between modern architecture and Marxism. Uh, this seems to be glaringly obvious. The softer versions of modern architecture got mixed up with theosophy, did they not? You, know, you, you ate crumbs of theosophy in Holland, as you also did in Wisconsin, and various sort of things emerged. But I take it that the hardline scene was ultimately Marxian, or something very like it. Now, when the bottom fell out of that position, or if you like, when modern architecture promised a utopia and a millennium, and the more modern architecture was built, the more the millennium was going to ensue. But when somehow you got modern architecture all over the place, and nothing had improved at all, then there followed a devaluation of iconic content. Uh, which is surely responsible for the present condition. Uh, what you do in that condition, nobody knows. But you first recognize it. You first recognize it, yes. That's what I would say. Uh, recognizing it, uh, you might be able to overcome it. Not recognizing it, uh, you will go on fumbling forever and ever like the English Constitution. Or lack of Constitution. Well, there is a, uh, a function of, of uh, one could imagine that modern architecture at this point, as a set of ideas, had a kind of function for a group of people, which was to enable them to assume direct contact with the object, direct objectivity. And this is, I think, how uh, the writings of those days have been interpreted. In other words, the people who wrote about function and use and so on didn't think of them as being abstract categories, which set up possible relations, like we had this morning from John, but rather they thought that they were dealing with the actuality. Now, there is a sense in which all language functions like that in the, in the uh, in short term. When we use language, uh, like for instance, to make sure that lunch is, is prepared, we don't worry about the rhetorical levels. We're concerned with the actual lunch, not with the statement. And I can't help thinking that the English empirical uh, appetite is really a kind of wish to stay down there where objects are objects and meals are meals, and you never have to look at anything in the way of a, uh, uh, an empirical <coughs> view of them or any kind of <coughs> metaphysical withdrawal from them. That is where we want to be. And it, uh, the question then is why did one architecture not particularly succeed in it? Why are we so bad at modern architecture? In an early edition of Focus, there's a uh, quotation from Corbu, you know, where he's, uh, Monsieur Le Corbusier said, if modern architecture succeeds in England, it can succeed anywhere. <laughs> Later in the day, he said, he didn't mean this in any uh, rude sense, but as a tribute to the soundness of English empiricism. Perhaps it's only there. Well, I mean. well it, it, it always failed in the United States. <coughs> I mean, you can, you can make the argument that Wright did not set out to make modern architecture. He set out to make what he thought was American architecture, you know, rather than modern, uh, which is, of course, a dubious enterprise, as far as I can see. Uh, but the, uh, the conversion of the towers of the Ville Radieuse into corporate headquarters along Park Avenue uh, seems, again, like a significant act of betrayal, doesn't it?
But Bob, I'm very serious about the need to destroy principle and to revive it every day. On that basis, it can live, but only by being extinguished in some, in some way every day. You know? well, I would like to Which is not a progressive dialect. Which is an endless dialect. No, it's, it's an endless dialect. It's not progressive. But there must be some progression of content, surely. You can't just say it's a game. It's just change. You know it's a game, but change. It's, you know, I'm sure there has to be uh, um, some relationship with uh, the real world. I mean, for instance, in science, the game of hypothesis destiny does actually lead to forms with dreadful constructive potential. In other words, the, the method of science, where it is Well, surely, so to, to simply fluctuate between principles of betrayal without any sense of the content. Architecture of its nature surely does not progress any more than literature of its nature progresses. Uh, one cannot say that Hemingway is better than Shakespeare or Gertrude Stein is better than, uh, who name it, Sophocles. Uh, it don't work that way. It, it creates and registers modes of sensibility, I would thought. And fantasies about the world. There seems to be more in it of a struggle to recreate the world, even as a tolerable normal. If we somehow didn't do this, it would degenerate. We fight in order to stay still, perhaps, but we still have to fight something. Well, the two issues, I mean, I would up to a point be, I hope or I imagine, somewhat Popperian, uh, as I understand Popper, who terrifies me and mostly bores me. Uh, but I'm thinking of two articles particularly, one of which is called Utopia and Violence, uh, which uh, Popper doesn't distinguish between a metaphorical utopia, which is an object of contemplation, and a prescriptive utopia, which is a blueprint for the future. And he condemns the prescriptive utopia as coercive, which I think is surely correct. And then, of course, he's very, very soft on tradition. Uh, traditions are the equivalent in society to hypotheses in science. They cannot be proved, but they order experience, and there's the obligation continuously to refute them. That seems to be the argument. It's very soft on tradition, very soft on tradition, very hard on utopia. But one would propose, surely, that some kind of utopian concept uh, must necessarily be present, always in a continuous condition of dialectic with tradition. Well, I'm just wondering whether the, this is for me an endless paradox that the, an understanding of the processes which are going forward, um, the sense of which is a constant regrouping through this dialectic of uh, form and content, a constant play between the event and structure, <coughs> is only in um, certain kinds of crystallized societies, which happen to be the one that the anthropologists of by and large observe, that this is a stable situation. And we haven't yet seen how Levin Strauss's um, explanation of these cultures observed in a state of status can be applied to what we think of as our dynamic, differentiated, specialized society with its high potential for destruction in Britain and Britain. And um, this, for me, is by, you know, very far from a closed question as to what extent we can anthropologize ourselves. To what extent does knowing the ropes <coughs> make me and this really into a cynic? Um, I feel that there is a problem here. I don't know whether, for instance, John Sissinger would think that what he had said before lunch could lead to cynicism, could lead to kind of playing of roles uh, in order to develop new possible contents, but with uh, destructive uh, results. Well, Bob, when I, I'm sorry interrupting, but when I uh, 
uh, remembered Israelis saying to the Dean of Windsor, no dogma, no dean, Mr. Dean. I invariably think of the bureaucrats of architectural education uh, who invariably say, well, you see, in our school, we're very liberal, and we have no bias, no prejudice, no dogma. You know, Ross heard it so many times. <laughs> and you know what it leads to. Mishmash. <laughs> or else the dogma is there, but it's concealed. The dogma is concealed. Well, that's wicked. I mean, people have an obligation to be as illuminated about themselves or the, the situation that they're in. Uh, they have that obligation. This is Kantian freedom through self-knowledge or something. In other words, put it loudly and clearly, what the hell is going to happen to the revolution Most ambitious revolutionary programs are written on the supposition that eventually we'll be able to scrap the slave clean. There won't be any Tories, won't be any Beastly Clippers, won't be any this, that, and the other. No, it's perfectly true. More honorable Marxists have said we don't dare to design the future. We have to cope with the present. The future has to be left to the character itself. It's quite true that there are honorable people in that position. Except that they're kept teetering on the brink of the decimal and they can never design anything whatsoever. If you're talking about designing the future, if you're talking about designing the future, which people are so interested in doing, I have quite a nice quote here which I thought I would bring along, and it's the announcement by the White House on July the 13th, 1969, of the creation of the National Girls Research uh, Institute. Uh, it says, there are increasing numbers of forecasting efforts in both public and private institutions which provide a growing body of information upon which to base judgments of probable future developments and of choices available. There is an urgent need to establish a more direct link between the increasingly sophistic sophisticated forecasting now being done and the decision-making process. The practical importance of establishing such a link is emphasized by the fact that virtually all the critical national problems of today could have been anticipated well in advance of their reaching critical proportions. An extraordinary array of tools and techniques has been developed by which it becomes increasingly possible to project future trends and thus to make the kind of informed choices which are necessary if we are to establish mastery over the process of change. Uh, these tools and techniques are gaining widespread use in the social and physical sciences, that, but they have not been applied systematically to the science of government. The idea, the time is at hand when they should be used and when they must be used. Uh, the ethos which is reflected in that quotation is very, very close to the ethos of modern architecture, particularly in its planning wings. Uh, and one thinks of it being made in the Nixon White House, and they couldn't have predicted the future in any very significant way. They won't even predict their own future. Calculus of felicity. He meant that it should be possible to measure 
human happiness on a linear scale and apply the whole apparatus of mathematical physics to it. And on his premise, almost all that is regarded as neutrally progressive in English legal and penal reform is founded. Unfortunately, as Robin Evans' best university has revealed to us all, he was a wire and a wire of the first magnitude. He thought he could see what all his fellows were up to, and therefore was capable of measuring exactly whether they were being happy or not. And therefore was capable, like a brain shrinker or a doctor, of prescribing an optimum arrangement of laws and so on for them. Now, one of the reasons I think why people in the English and American tradition get perpetually confused is that superficially, totally different ideologies which proceed from utopian Hegelianism, utopian Marxism, look superficially very much like that. In fact, I think they're very different capitalization. In fact, I think they're both very much mistaken. And in fact, I think they both do more harm than good on average. But unfortunately, and this is bound up with the whole issue of modern architecture, with the maximization of transparency, spiritualization, the maximal use of glass, and so on, regardless of ethos. Unfortunately, modern architecture is also mixed up with the idea that there should be no activity of our own, which we couldn't admit to publicly. In other words, that in principle, it ought to be possible for the public to see what goes on in everybody's bedroom as well as see, and is this even desirable, what goes on in everybody's living room. Of course, we're all going to have to face a crunch point on this, because the British government, whether you like it or not, is just bringing back in a panic re resolution on the back of the factory to its construction act, which is that we can't have more than 30% of single players going to in any building, whether you like it or not, in order to save our one. But the fact remains that I've been into suburbs constructed according to the most impeccable principles of the Grotius Bauhaus, which is that the building should be dematerialized and transparent. And all the people inside were awfully self-conscious. They were like persons. Well, they were like the students in Sandy Wilson's Keys College extension dormitory. Uh, if you draw the curtains, everyone can see the dark to no good. If you don't draw the curtains, they can see what you're up to. So there is no privacy. No. It is highly significant that two philosophies which have been domineering, not to say dominating, in Europe for the last 2,000 years have not admitted the concept of privacy. One is extreme religious for our philosophies with the practice of the confessional, leaving trip cyclists who have inherited that role out of them. Out of them. The other is totalitarian philosophies like Hitler's and stuff. No privacy is admitted, and correspondingly, no arena of action is permitted either, where you can come out and act politically. So that, <coughs> unfortunately, notions about modern architecture are very closely bound up with notions of the public and the private in the political realm, and unfortunately, in their enthusiasm for human betterment, the radicals in both camps have not, I think, afforded us a comparison of situations in which we do have some liberty of action left. They want the maximization of liberty of action. I had all this out at a union meeting the other evening. Six different previous <laughs> friends of neo Marxists each asked to be given the chairmanship. And this was so preposterous because they were boiled one another in oil. Ventus, Ventus, like St. Peter's is being boiled by Helvetius for his heresy on his heresy. <laughs> but we all said this is preposterous. No, no, no. But the fact remains that this is the current situation. This in architecture, where people can't boil one another. Sam, what do you know about hermeneutic dialectics? This in politics is the situation. I said, no, I said, what do you know about hermeneutic dialectics? Hmm? What are hermeneutic dialectics? Uh, ask Danny Borbesley. He is the great exponent of hermeneutic dialectics. dialectics. I read a book, I gather there are two intellectual traditions. One is called Logical Empiricism, abbreviated as LE, uh, practiced in the Anglo-Saxon world and its cultural dependencies in Scandinavia. 
Yeah. Uh, and the other is hermeneutic dialectics, abbreviated as HD, uh, extensively practiced in France and Germany and Central Europe. I know nothing more about it than that. I believe I'm talking hermeneutic dialectics, HD, rather than LE, but I don't know about that. Well, I'm all the different position because I've got very good foreign contracts for all that much foreign accounts history. But I gather that hermeneutic dialectics is more and more ancient tradition going back to Descartes. In other words, it is that some thoughts are valid regardless of what you experience. A fact that for Englishman reduces itself to a platitude. But nonetheless, operating as an Englishman in the mind, mean mostly looking down at you. Uh, three fifths English. <laughs> but here's a problem with the extreme English empiricism. There's a problem with the whole business of group facts. Let's face it, there are facts, but they're not that beautiful. And no fact emerges into human consciousness apart from theoretical considerations. That part of continental tradition is perfectly clear. If that's no new to dialectics, then I'm a hermeneutic dialectician. Did, did uh, we... Did talk about hermeneutic dialectics? Uh, were we treated to uh, HD uh, approach to architecture by uh, the New York School for uh, Peter's, in Peter's talk yesterday as well? I wasn't there, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Corbusier's natural man was the guy on the roof terrace at Geneva with his punch bag or punch ball, but he comes out looking like a Michelangelo type, whereas the gorillas are the real thing, I think. HD, uh, I'll rather try to put my effort into building up a half an hour of optimism because that long at least I have to survive. And uh, I would rather start with something which seems to be quite symptomatic for all the conversation about such abstract issues, the one which I'm almost hesitant to mention again, starts with the letter C. And uh, if during the talk, we might come to the point that we wish to call it conceptual again, we might do it. Nevertheless, I would like to start with an exercise which is very similar and perhaps almost a continuation of the conceptual meal, which has been practicing in the moments of exhaustion in the corner of the studio, trying to imagine, in fact, see, conceptualize, what is it possible to, what is possible to make from the most ridiculous materials like plaster, for instance. You can make anything from plaster. And it went on in aphorisms, going on from one item to another. 
from uh, making trees, from plants, to making cars, from plants, to completely with people inside, and so on. Conversation was almost going up if and I <coughs> up to a point when somebody, unfortunately, said that, uh, what about making a bag of plaster from plaster? And uh, I think it's very symptomatic for the conceptualization as such. There is something inherited, inherited in, or something absolutely crucial or essential about the very nature of concept, that they do tend to culminate in something which seems to be an uttermost perfection and conclusion, which is first the point you started from, which means nothingness. And I'm afraid that most of the conversation we had here yesterday and today tend to deviate to this kind of deadlock. Um, as I promised, I'll start with a, some hope for optimism, that we can still look at it with certain calm, not take it too seriously, and still be able to get perhaps something which is interesting, I would say rather fascinating, about the whole business of concept on one side. On the other side, to see the second half of the story, which was only rarely mentioned and more or less turned into aphorisms, talking about the other side of conceptual, which means what is not conceptual. I do agree with most of those who said architecture is conceptual, isn't it? I would say even further and say the whole culture we're talking about, or well, we're living in, is conceptual, isn't it? And it would be very difficult for anybody, I think, to say where the concepts do end, where is the beginning of uh, what you might call concept and what is, in true sense, non-conceptual. Um, I want to start with definition I would not make any of those. <coughs> I would rather start with something which is much more down to earth and start with uh, an attempt to see what might be not conceptual. The non-conceptual quite obviously is the situation when the possibility to use the word with full awareness and use it with certain skill wasn't here. And it's quite clear that there are two aspects to the whole problem of concept. One of them is that it seems to be almost everywhere, but on the other side it seems to be changing. There seems to be something like a decisive point where the notion becomes something different. I think that the whole fact or the uh, event here uh, is symptom of some uh, attractiveness at least. There is something very special. I cannot imagine that people 100 years ago would hold a conference on something like conceptual architecture. It might have been felt by some that there is such a possibility to conceptualize and dream about architecture in conceptual sense. However, nobody would turn into an issue. Now, this issue is going from one end of London to another, from one uh, end of Europe to another, through uh, literature and music and architecture and art in general, and to a certain extent, of course, life in general. And there's obviously something very specific about the particular period we're going through. Uh, I would, again, leave that for the very end and uh, rather try to approach it from the rather less orthodox point, which means not starting with definition, but starting with descriptions, what is available, what is given, what we can really look at without being too much obsessed with a clear notion of the definition and so on. Uh, I think the first thing to uh, accept or uh, look at is the very nature of what seem to be uh, quite clearly non-conceptual. And, you know, we probably would all agree that uh, perception, what takes place in the spontaneity of our daily life, is certainly something which one wouldn't call concept. Now, on the other side, it's quite clear that uh, we cannot draw the line and say, you know, the percept goes up to here, and suddenly we begin to think, we begin to formalize, we begin to schematize, we begin to structure things into <coughs> notions, notional images, from notional images to notional concepts, and concepts in pure sense, general, and so on. Uh, I think the point, the interesting point, rather fascinating one, is that in perception itself, there's a great deal of imaginary, there is a great deal of non-real. We are permanently anticipating whatever you're looking at, we know beforehand that we want to see it. The whole richness of perception it is not inconceivable to grasp without uh, certain selectivity. The selectivity goes almost spontaneously from our side, from our side. And uh, the percept already is in fact a 
form of imagination. Now, the imagination is something which invites us directly to dream. And once we are dreaming, we are, in fact, in another level. We are in a level which is not identifiable with the directly given. In the dream, we can withdraw. In the dream, we can see an alternative. I'm talking about daydreaming. And the daydreaming is already something which some would like to call conceptualization. We know very well that this is the level where already certain notions, certain possibilities of a uh, creative gesture do take place. Now, the state of dreaming is something which I would almost at the same time identify with our possibility or our intentionality to use the dreaming and turn it into something which is much more stable, which is much more uh, manipulatable, if you like, which is something which one can turn into much more consistent uh, process, approach, or something which can be followed with greater sense. The possibility to do it this was entirely based on two fundamental conditions. And I think that's where the process, which later becomes a process of concept, conceptualization, really starts. The condition is that whatever we do, whatever we manage to achieve in withdrawing from the immediately given, has to be supported, has to be protected, has to be fixed, has to be stabilized. 